Uh, good morning, everyone. If we could uh, just grab our seats here, we're going to get ready for a, a, a big appearance. Uh, my name's Hardave Burke. I'm with Rogers Communications. And on a personal note, I've been coming to this conference for about a decade, and it's always amazing every year to hear from leading policy experts, make new friends, and reconnect with old ones. And it's so great to see kind of the resurgence of the conference this year, the biggest conference I think they've ever had. And so Rogers is really proud to partner with Canada Strong and Free, and I'm happy we're able to play a, sm a small role in bringing you folks together. Uh, we know it's important to connect Canadians coast to coast, and that's why we proudly reinvest 90% of our revenues back into Canadian jobs, Canadian connectivity, and Canadian infrastructure. Our next speaker is from one of the most important markets for Rogers, and we're going to be hearing from the Premier of New Brunswick, Blaine Higgs. He's going to be talking about federalism, the carbon tax, and parental rights. Premier Higgs was born and raised in New Brunswick, and after a career in the business sector, was elected to the Legislative Assembly in 2010. He served as Minister of Finance, along with a handful of other crucial portfolios that have built New Brunswick, and he was elected leader of the PC party in 2016. In 2018, Blaine Higgs became the 34th Premier of New Brunswick when he led the PC party to victory and actually formed the first minority government in New Brunswick in 100 years. In 2020, Premier Higgs was re-elected and secured a majority mandate. And, you know, in fact, he's doing a lot of things the government here in Ottawa could learn about, including balancing the budget year after year and investing in uh, real jobs in the economy in New Brunswick. And interviewing the Premier today will be Andrew Lawton, who's a broadcaster, columnist, and editor-in-chief with True North and the host of The Andrew Lawton Show. Andrew's also the author of an upcoming biography of Pierre Polyev that will be released next month, so I encourage you all to take a look at that online. And uh, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Premier Higgs and Andrew Lawton up to the stage. Hello. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All my life, I've wondered how to get a standing ovation, and apparently it's to walk on stage with Premier Higgs, so thank you for letting me bask in that. And thank you to everyone for being here this morning. I, I love the format of the fireside chat, mainly because it's Ottawa and you need to be by the side of a fire to survive for nine of the 12 months of the year. But uh, also, we get the chance, especially in front of an audience like this, to delve into some of the issues that I don't think you get on your average CBC panel. And uh, that doesn't mean we're going to give you a totally easy ride on this premiere, but I, I do want to give you the chance to talk about issues that I, I know matter to people in this room and, and those watching from beyond. And normally you try to warm up to the controversial stuff, but I feel like you can take the controversial stuff because you've been quite a leader on this issue. So let's start with transgender issues and parental rights. <laughs> because... <laughs> let, start there and then we'll see how it goes. Because this is an issue that... We understand why other premiers have taken actions they've taken in the last few months on this. In a lot of cases, it was because you had, and they had their own supporters pushing them to do very similar things. You were the first one. So let me just ask you, when you put that policy forward that required parental consent for, for gender changes, for re-identifications at school, why did you go there? Well, thank you for the question, Andrew. I, I guess the point was it that we... Um, Throughout this whole duration of being in politics, I came at a time when I already had a career. And, and I wanted to bring a lot of um, ideas that I learned and decision processes I learned, but also on the foundational principle that you, you, know, you do what's right and, and the rest will fall in place. Now that doesn't always work in politics, it seems, but nevertheless, that's the philosophy we live by. And, and through this whole discussion, it became a policy that kind of got into our educational system without a whole lot of discussion or detailed discussion um, with our caucus. And after the election of 2020, and then a little while after, we started, I started asking questions about it in detail. And then when I read the paragraph that basically caused teachers to hide information from parents and to do so as part of the request of the policy, I, you know, it, this just wasn't right. This, this, this isn't the foundation of families that we, we, we build on. And it was interesting, my wife and I talked about this and, and prior to, to making it an issue, and um, by the way, we've we're been married for 46 years this summer, and uh, four, four daughters, five grandchildren. We're very close to our family, and, and the, uh, the idea that we would hide 
information. We thought, what would we, how would we like that if that happened? So, uh, so then we started bringing it as a question. And then, then we saw some of the curriculum that was being taught in the, on a parent or school day, a school teacher's day. Um, and, and you'd say, or uh, professional development day is what it's called. Anyway, you'd see, you'd see well, wh where's the curriculum here that involves um, math and science and, and literacy and, and numeracy? Where, where, where's that in all this? So, so the challenge was, how do you have the debate on a sensitive issue, recognizing the reality of it all, but finding a path to do it? And I think that we've walked away from too many controversial issues, and that is why we've seen um, kind of an erosion of what we might have always considered standard. It becomes normalized, and, and it's not because it's normal, it's normal, it's different. And we are a society that, that absolutely recognizes and, and supports all of our differences but let's not exclude family as part of that process. It was an issue that, for someone like me who, who doesn't follow New Brunswick politics explicitly, and I, I'd say probably ha has done so a little bit more thanks to you and, and stuff you've been doing there, it was not something that was really accurately defined by the media, what you did. I, I think before I read the actual, <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, well, as we heard from the last panel, it's okay. Uh, they should have just been uh, watching, reading the line and, and other outlets like that. But you were doing something that was a relatively moderate proposal. And, and even a lot of people that are in the parental rights space that have been advocating for something similar were saying, well, it's a compromise. He's, he's not going far enough. It's a good start. But you were, to the activists that were against you, it was as though you had gone so far, you had done something so radical, you had done something so far right as the term. I mean, did you ever imagine that you would be labeled as far right when you were elected as premier, uh, you know, going back to, to 2013? And, and why is this issue one that has been maligned in that way? Well, just recently I was asked about um, the case of the far right, and isn't it, isn't it amazing that in today's world, far right is, as, is having parents involved with their kids? Isn't, isn't that amazing? So I say that tells you how far the spectrum has actually moved and, and how we need to find a path forward. But, but in, in analyzing kind of what we wanted to bring forward is let's address this. And then looking abroad, looking what's going on in Europe, particularly what's going on in Europe, about how they manage real issues around gender dysphoria, but how they look at it as, you know, getting the right process for treatment and, and through psychologists, psychiatrists to understand, okay, how do we manage this? Because it, it in some cases, it's very real. But in other cases, it's, it's a process of kids growing up, and that's where parents are that one continuum of, on, in their life. And so, so we just say, okay, we want parents to be involved. And no, I didn't imagine it would be such a controversial issue uh, because it seems like such a, um, a basic, fundamental principle that we all cherish. One of the <laughs> things that I find interesting, though, is that there are a lot of issues that tend to be within the domain of what we would call social conservatives. And, and these issues tend to get uh, treated as political third rails. You can't talk about this, you, you can't talk about that. This is an issue that I think is very much in a line with where a lot of social conservatives wanted to take society, but it seems to have a broader appeal. I, I mean, the number of folks that I've spoken to that have supported what you've done in New Brunswick or what uh, Premier Danielle Smith has done in Alberta that would not identify as pro-life, would not identify as uh, anti-gay marriage, but on this issue, they're there. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, how has there been a coalition that does seem to be very large, not just within the conservative movement, but even within society itself, behind some of these policies. I think the risk we're facing in, in, um, in Canada and the, and the risk that we see in the US is, is we've, we've drifted so far from what people look at as common sense and, and to how to manage the next steps. And we've drifted ideologically so far that all of a sudden people kind of say, whoa, this, this, has, got, this has to be addressed. So I think what we're seeing is, okay, here's something that's so basic, so fundamental, and yet it, it's an issue. But it will cause us, I think, to all be part of, 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 of the solution. And when I think that we put teachers in a position to not be truthful with, with the child's parents, um, why aren't teachers speaking up and saying, you know, we need to be part of this? And when we, when, when we talk about, okay, this, is, this can be irreparable um, surgeries that could happen to young children, why aren't doctors speaking up? and saying, okay, we, we believe we need to manage this, we need this how it needs to be done. Um, I, I refer to the European model now that this, the, you know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the UK have all changed their policies to look at a different way to deal with the, with the problem. Always recognize there's a problem and always recognizing there's a way to protect every individual 
um, in their in their beliefs and, and how we manage through that. But but not just ignoring um, the the reality of what makes sense and what's real. So so I think that's a, the the purpose for me is that we need to find the, the moderate approach here, and sometimes the definition because you saw what happened in, in my in New Brunswick. So we are a progressive conservative party, but people jump on one side or the other wholeheartedly without mm -hmm. trying to find the balance in the middle. And that's what we're trying to find. And sometimes it creates a bit of a firestorm. My wife will often say when I come home at night, what fire did you start today? <laughs> and, I, and she said, I was reading the news. I said, that's your first problem. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> as long as it's true north, we'll, uh, we'll forgive her. But. <laughs> right, fair enough. There's one, Nate, good for you. Let me ask you, before we get on to that definitional problem, which I think is tremendously important, did you anticipate that you were starting something that would become a pretty national wave? And I, I'm curious if you had other conversations with premiers on either way that say, hey, thank you for breaking the seal on this so we can, or what the hell are you doing? Do you realize what my caucus expects me to do now? Well, y yes, we, we certainly have talked um, amongst um, colleagues, and certainly, um, you know, I, I um, had discussions with many, many, and many have different views, and that's what we are in Canada. But, but I, I certainly um, look at what um, Saskatchewan is doing and what, and what um, Daniel Smith is doing in, in, um, in Alberta. And, and I, I guess I'd like to think that at the end of the day, we'll find a solution that, that doesn't seem to be far right, it just seems to be really right. And I mean by that, it's, it's, it's such a, a correct path forward. And, and so, in those discussions, and did I think it would turn into a national thing? No, that wasn't discussion. When my wife and I talked about this, and I said, you know, this is gonna be the week, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this. Um, we both realized this could be um, the, the issue that either continues us in government or takes us out but we were both prepared to say, fair enough. And um, so, and I, I think there lies the whole challenge that we have as a society, as politicians, as members of any profession, which I just stated with healthcare and with, with uh, education, is to say, I will do what I believe is correct. I will voice my opinion in a very respectful, mannerful way to, to improve what I believe needs to be improved. And it doesn't have to be protests and blowing horns and jumping on the street, but it has very adult discussions that say, I'm not afraid to talk about it. Let's talk about that <laughs> progressive conservative name, because that, that's always been to many people an inherent contradiction. And you have some people in the conservative family in this country that say, no, I'm a proud progressive conservative, and that means something very specific to them. You have others that just sort of tolerate it because that's the name of the party. And we also don't have in Canada the harmonization of the federal and provincial uh, right-leaning parties, which is why you have this patchwork from BC where you now have two warring parties that are, are going for right-of-center votes and you have in Alberta a complete unique situation there. I'm curious how that, I was just trying to gloss over that, but I heard a laugh, that was, that was apparently a laugh line for someone from Alberta, but I, <laughs> I, I'm curious about your perspective on that in New Brunswick, because you're a, a progressive conservative premier, and I, I think that a lot of people would say that you are putting forward very ironclad, small c conservative principles with no need for a, a qualifier there, but how does that affect your navigation of, of that coalition that you have in New Brunswick, and also how New Brunswick fits into the Canadian conservative family? Well, it adds a kind of a new dimension of, of um, I won't say confusion, but certainly um, an irony there that exists with, with the two, with the progressive conservative, because some people will grab a hold of the progressive piece, and some people will grab a hold of the conservative piece, and then you have to kind of bridge that within, within caucus. And, and as you know, back last June, I didn't bridge that very successfully, um, because I had six members of caucus that basically stood, stood against the government and voted against the government. Um, so, so it, it does bring uh, or, uh, an issue, but, but I think at the, at the same time, it's, it's how, how do you have the discussions, how do you, and, I, and coming from a business world, and I know people say, well, you know, sometimes you, you just move along too fast. Um, I'll have a lot of meetings, a lot of debate, a lot of discussions, and there comes a point in time where you just got to get on with it. And um, so we got on with it last June after numerous meetings and caucus and such, but there were six individuals, maybe eight, that, um, that we're not, not happy with that, and, and it causes angst. So you can see the political um, upheaval that kind of creates. And um, we, were, we were joking here, of coming in, talking about, because I did in a, in a state of the province, I, I did a, the people didn't know if I was gonna run again, and I put a song at the end of it, an old clash song that said, should I stay or should I go? 
and and uh, kind of danced off the stage. But this this time, uh, when we did the State of the Province, there's a lot of great things to talk about in the province, and and I was thinking my song should be the Elton John one that uh, I'm still standing, uh, <laughs> because uh, but, but I was recommended against that, but. Premier Higgs is leading karaoke in the Shore Club yeah. downstairs at, uh, <laughs> at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. But I'll, I'll ask you on that, Premier, when you mention those six members that left your caucus, do you view that as being, well, if I can just use a blunt word, a, a failure of your leadership to keep your party together? Or do you believe that the coalition was too broad and those people really didn't belong in your party in the first place? No, it's a challenge that I, you know, probably if my interest was how do I survive the next election, then I probably would have found a different way to try to manage through it, but I wouldn't have had the same result. Hmm. And that, I think, is what happens to many of us, is we get watered down in our own beliefs because we're trying to appease the masses. Uh, we had diverse opinions, but that goes two ways. It goes two ways that, okay, if I have 80 percent of caucus that are on side and want to move forward, and I have 20 percent that don't, it's rare for ever you get a consensus within caucus of, of unanimity. Just, just doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't happen, um, or extremely rare. So, so the point that, okay, we have the majority of caucus, we're ready to move on this. Um, and the Minister of Education, he and I, we're ready to move. We presented, we've talked. It was time. So, yeah, we could have talked about it a lot longer, but I didn't see an end in sight. I, it was going to be, a, 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 we were never going to convince some, all the while we had, we had full support of, as I say, 80% of the caucus. But let me extend that thought to its logical conclusion here, because if it sounds like, I'm gonna do one of those, it sounds like you're saying things, uh, that, uh, like Kathy Newman and Jordan Peterson, but I'm, I'm gonna try to actually represent what you're saying, or at least as I understand <laughs> it, that there's a risk for conservative parties of trying to be too many things to too many people. And that this big tent, which is often viewed a, as a feature of the conservative movement, actually carries its own cohesion challenges. Oh, it does. Absolutely does. And what you're seeing is, uh, I mean, we see the Liberal Party. I mean, if you want to talk about far left, I mean, the, the, how far can you get? Um, and this isn't a political... Don't, don't challenge them. This They'll find a, a way. <laughs> this is not a political discussion, though, is it? I, I agree. <laughs> um, but, but the idea, and, and you see, to your point, you raised earlier, that that's where the spectrum is going. And everybody, everybody is taking, oh, well, I'm way over here on, mm -hmm. on the left side. And, and I think that is our job as conservatives to find... The, the, the way to have the detailed discussions and the frank discussions. And I'm, I'm saying that, and what I'm excited about, and he, he'll be here a little later, Pierre Polyev, what I've seen from the rallies he's had in, in New Brunswick and the people that are showing up, we went to a rally, the average age was probably 35,000, 1,200 people. I think that's just wonderful to see young people coming into our party and getting involved. Since you mentioned Pierre Polyev, who uh, will be here at 11.30 and not right now, as some people were disappointed to see me on stage, <laughs> but he has been touring the country on his, it started as the Axe the Tax rally, and now it's the Spike the Hike rally, and I think there's going to be another rhyme next week, but uh, the galvanizing issue for the federal conservatives right now has been opposing the carbon tax, and this has been an issue in... Uh, certainly in your province as well. Uh, we've seen provinces sue the federal government. We've seen the Supreme Court side against provinces on this. And then I think for the most part, the federal government's carbon tax was pretty safe until they decided that, you know, Atlantic Canadians with home heating oil needed a bit of a carve out. And then it sort of undermined their, their whole premise here. And I, I'm curious for you, first off, how much of an issue is that uh, electorally speaking, as you gear up for an election for, for people in New Brunswick, this, this carbon tax, but, but also, how do you anticipate this going when you have a federal government that right now doesn't even want to meet with premiers on this issue, which is, I mean, Justin Trudeau loves talking and he loves people having to hear him talk, but this is like one opportunity to uh, sit down that he doesn't want to take because he doesn't want to hear what the premiers like you have to tell him. Well, it's, it's disappointing, but you get used to it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so sometimes you don't bother, but we are bothering. So there was a, a question asked that, oh, well, if other provinces have a solution, then, then let us know. So, so the, the idea for us in New Brunswick, and worldwide, really, is, to, is for Canada to punch well above its weight in terms of reducing world emissions. Mm -hmm. We can talk about our 1.8% of world emissions, and we can cause everybody in every household across this country to spend more and, and, and have less and do less. Or we can say we've always been a, a nation that's rich in ener energy. It has, it has given us the lifestyle we have, but it's also given us the ability to help others. 
So isn't it sad, when I was in Europe a few years ago, uh, spring talking to different people, that it was after the, the invasion in Ukraine, and they're saying all through this, we're absolutely shocked that a, can a country as rich as Canada is not supplying any energy to Europe to offset Russian oil and gas. Absolutely shocked. So, so when you think about that for a minute, we've spent how many millions or billions to help Ukraine? So on the one hand, we, we supply arms and, uh, to the war, which we're not regrudging. We, we wanted to do that. But, but then on the other hand, we're allowing the forcing them to buy Russian oil and gas and finance from the other side. So then you look at what can we do about that in, in addition to supplying what we have here. On the world emission side, we in, in New Brunswick, we have 77 trillion standard cubic feet of natural gas sitting, waiting to be developed. Out west, this is happening. We have an LNG plant that is, that is waiting to be converted to an export facility. It is, it is an import built, built back 15 years ago. So we have supply. We have market. We have four countries, right without even asking, saying we'll sign up for a 20-year deal. Hmm. We have 174 coal plants in, in Europe. We have China building coal plants at the rate of, of two a week, 100 a year. They operate 1,100 coal plants. For every coal plant that's shut down by natural gas, we reduce emissions by 50%. So you say, wow, we have an opportunity right here in New Brunswick to shut down coal plants. Total Energy, a major, one of the world's largest energy companies, said one of their key p p pillars, of their four pillars, is to develop as much natural gas worldwide as they can and shut down as many coal plants as they can because it'll have a bigger impact, quicker impact than anything else that is happening. And at the same time, the affordability issue in our country goes, goes away or diminishes greatly because we'll use those same resources to fund technology, research, development. And when do people start using and acting differently? You know, I think years ago about the film industry when, when digital photography came along, where would you find a film camera now? When, and the same thing with LED lights. Well, now you just look for LED lights because of, of their, their brightness and their energy consumption. When we have the ability to have that sort of technological advancement, people will change their ambits. We'll be able to meet the requirements, which we cannot meet today from the federal policies. We, have a, we are putting forward a policy to, to, the, to the, and I actually have it, coincidentally, here with me, but, um, and it's called No Tax Required. Just support us developing gas and shutting down coal plants in the process. And I'm submitting that letter to, to the Prime Minister and saying, here's an option. You wanted a solution? Here it is. But think out of the box. Think bigger. Think of the impact that this country can have on worldwide emissions, not in our own little bubble of 1.8%. Mm -hmm. I must say, I've been quite surprised that Justin Trudeau keeps inviting European heads of government and state here because every time they come, yeah. they all do an interview with, you know, Vashi Capellos or something and say, oh, I'd love to buy LNG. And then Justin Trudeau has to come out and say, ah, oh, there's no business case. But uh, it is quite, I mean, it, it, it's a joke, but it, I mean, it, a lot of the government's a joke, but there's a particular <laughs> absurdity to this in that you have people literally lining up to buy something. You have industry Maybe. lining up to sell something. And the only, to appropriate the language of uh, one of our next speakers, the gatekeeper, is the federal government. And th th we're not even looking for uh, a, a, an issue here. It's not an issue where someone is looking for a subsidy. It, they're looking for permission. Exactly right. And, and that's the sole absurdity here. It, it's actually quite despicable. You have industry, you have buyers, you have an economic argument for it, you have an environmental argument for it, and a federal government standing in the way. And I mean, uh, as a premier, do you feel like this is just bad policy, or do you feel this is illegal policy? This is government actually violating its constitutional requirements to respect what's supposed to be your domain. All the above. Um, and it's not the only one, mm -hmm. right? And there's, um, it's kind of we're getting used to the bad policy phenomena from, from Ottawa. The, 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 the concept, I think, of, of this is, for us is that we don't need federal money, to your point, it's a business case. Out, out west, they didn't need federal money. It was bad law that, that caused mm -hmm. them to have to buy a pipeline, and that was, what, four or five times more in the expense to taxpayers? We don't want them to have any part of this. We, we said, just leave us alone. But you can't put rules in place that say, if you if you're, don't have a plant up and running by 2030 or whatever the number, 2028, 20, um, then it can't run for more than five years or it has to be shut down. Like, there's a, there's a new clause in that that basically developers are saying, no, no, I need a 20-year runway here. So, so you can't do that. So policy is causing a problem. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the reality, people, generally, people are, are starting now with the affordability issue all of a sudden. Wow, this is, uh, this is kind of a bite. 
and and and, and your point about um, about the, the the break on the it, it said well polls trump climate change didn't it really mm -hmm. that's what it said the big message is that oh if you can do it in the eastern canada why can't we do it elsewhere but i think the bigger message is why can't we do something better and and that is the challenge and the prime minister is in this ideological frame of mind that uh, better just doesn't register and mm -hmm. um so I keep pushing that give us the ability and, and be part of the solution to help promote the right legislation. But also, then, then that gives the First Nations more of um, an understanding of, okay, I, I can be part of this now. Because, because obviously, to do a development like we want to do in New Brunswick, we need First Nations to be part of that. And they will, they will be major, major benefactor, benefactors of, mm -hmm. of that. And so I'm, say, I'm excited about that. And we're working through that with them, but again, it requires policy that says, it's okay. So what relationship would you like to see? Because, and I'm going to be speaking with, with Premier Smith tomorrow, and I think Alberta has generally, as a matter of survival, had to be a lot more forceful against Ottawa for you know, much of the last uh, several decades. But when you look at that relationship that you would like to see, the one that you have now, the one that possibly Pierre Polyev, assuming he's elected, would be able to provide you as a Premier, and assuming you win your re-election, what should that look like? Well, I've always been a strong Federalist for, for, for a good reason. Um, not only the national pride of our nation, but also because, uh, and I also believe in, in that Alberta and, and Saskatchewan, but Alberta particularly has been paying the bills for a long time in this nation. I think they would agree as well. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and I know several years ago as, as a, um, you know, a maritimer that, that you all know, our, our, we were um, a recipient of transfer funds at about 30% of our budget. But you know, I, I'm not proud of that. I'm honored to be part of it because it makes the lifestyle in our province equitable with other parts of the country. But, but this project that I'm talking about to develop, I've always said, and I've said it for many years and, and nationally and when I'm in the meetings with my colleagues, I don't believe that we should be in a position not developing resources that we have, which are the very ones that we're relying on the, for, from, from Alberta to pay the bills. I just don't think that's fair. Yeah. I actually think they uh, moved Danielle Smith to tomorrow because they were worried if you were here the same day she would ask for the money back. Uh, I think that <laughs> might have been the, the, the risk there. But <laughs> as we talk about the road forward, I, I know you and Premier Smith have actually had quite a, a good relationship. And uh, for a lot of reasons, you've had a, a common foe in, in the federal government in Ottawa. I wanted to ask about a, a policy that you're championing uh, in New Brunswick that is coming up that I know Alberta ha has done as well and is also one of these issues that I think is becoming one where there's a fair bit of national momentum. And I, I don't know how much is public, so I think you know what I'm talking about, though, so I'll just give you the floor on this. Well, and it's our Compassionate Care Intervention Bill that we plan to bring forward in the legislature in May. Um, and it is a tough one uh, because he, we've had some very significant incidents in our, on the homeless side in our province over the last two months. We've had um, you know, homeless individuals that have lost and had to amputate their legs because they, they froze, uh, frozen. We've, we've had two deaths here recently, back about maybe two, two or three weeks ago, that, that basically were tent fires and, and uh, people trying to keep warm. And I called the daughter of, of um, one of the victims that died in the fire, uh, and about a week after or less. And I knew that he, he, he would certainly be upset for good, good reason. But of course, it's all kind of, um, you know, things we could do better as government. And I don't deny any of that of how, because we shouldn't have the situation. But I'd made a statement about how do we convince people to come off the street when you know they're not capable of, of making a decision on their own, you know their life's at risk, and how do you find a path to say, wow, safety has got to play a role here? And, and of course, the, the, the question is, well, we can't do that. If they don't want to come, they don't want to come. So where does our humanity kick in? And you say, I know that individual won't be alive in the morning. So what we're trying to say, there are extreme cases that we can analyze and, and find a, a solution so a person does not suffer the life-changing issues that they suffer from being exposed to the elements. And then, of course, it's the whole concept about um, how do we find a path out of drugs and addiction. I am not a supporter of, of continued um, drug being on a, on, a, on a program that continues to, to keep a person um, addicted to drugs. I believe in recovery. 
you obviously could not be geographically further from British Columbia. I would argue politically <laughs> further from British Columbia, too. <laughs> but do you look at British Columbia and see a, a very useful model for everything to do the opposite of? You know, it's funny you say that because uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, they have been a perfect example of what not to do. Hmm. And, and so why do we pretend otherwise? And I've had, I had uh, just this week met with several people that are serving the, the uh, homeless in the Fredericton area. And, and we talked about some of the challenges. But for me, it's like, hey, wh how do people get here? And, and how do we find a way that, that we can find them um, out? How do we find a way to, to, to help them return to a normal life? And what is normal could be very different for different people. But, but the, the interesting part came back to, well, if someone doesn't want to go, they, you know, they can't give them help. And I asked the question, because we're looking at a, um, a med mental health and addiction mm -hmm. treatment center, because along with addiction, the mental health plays a big role. Um, and we're working to develop that, and we have a building and such. Um, but but the, the point that they, they were raising, well, if someone wants to go to be treated, they've got to have a place to go immediately. As soon as they say, okay, I'm ready, they've got a place to go. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, so that's Friday night. What if they say Saturday night or Sunday night or Monday morning, no, I don't think this is for me. I don't think I want to stay here. What do you do then? Well, you have to let them go. Well, I said, how many cycles do you get into for that? Because you just keep going around and around and around. So it isn't one of those tough discussions. But we know homeless situations are increasing. We know New Brunswick affordability's played a role. We've had an increase in population like we haven't seen for 100 years. And, and property values have gone up. Um, nothing like we'd have here in Ontario, mind you, just for anyone who wants to move to New Brunswick. Um, <laughs> they, they <laughs> but, but the idea is that it, it's, it's a case where people generally have seen a step change in their ability to afford where they were. So we need to not lose sight of them and have them be exposed to, to the situation that we don't want them to live and become accustomed to. And, and so we have to react quicker. We have all kinds of social uh, assistance uh, caseworkers. And when I said, um, ask the question, okay, so what relationship do our caseworkers have with the individuals on the street? How often do you see them? And one of the answers I got, well, monthly. Monthly? Yeah, when I'm handing out the check. That's not that's not servicing the needs of the people with the people we have in the system. I would like it noted he ended as the timer hit five seconds. You would have a great career in radio, Premier, if uh, <laughs> the next election doesn't work out well. You'd get out, and get out in time for news and traffic. Well, uh, Premier Blaine Higgs, you have uh, put New Brunswick Conservatives on the map for a lot of people across the country, and I know it's been uh, a pleasure, I suspect, for everyone in the room. Uh, it has certainly been a pleasure for me, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. And with that, as we close, I'm going to welcome Corey tonight to the stage.